Hi, and welcome to this session, which is an introduction to open access presented by the UNCG University Libraries. If you'd like to consult these slides in the future or follow along now, you can find them at this Go link, go.uncg.edu slash tap OA2022. This is me, I'm Anna Kraft. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the coordinator of scholarly communications in the UNCG University Libraries. Today in this session, we'll define open access or OA. We'll explain the differences between closed and open access scholarship. We'll address some myths about open access scholarship and discuss the benefits of sharing your scholarship through open access. We'll also explain a little bit about different open access pub publishing models and offer some information about OA support from the university libraries at UNCG. So first, let's talk about open versus closed access. Open access, or OA, is both a publishing model and a method for sharing published scholarship. When materials are published or shared through open access, they're made available online and they're accessible to all readers at no cost without sign-ins or other barriers. Closed access, on the other hand, is a model that's been around a lot longer and predates online access. In this model, content requires a personal or institutional subscription. Online, this content is generally behind what we call a paywall. In print, this is something that an individual or an institution or a library would pay to subscribe to, like a journal. Closed access may also be referred to as subscription-based, toll access, reader pays, or traditional academic publishing. Who can access closed scholarship? It's really just limited to subscribers. So these are often libraries and other research institutions that subscribe on behalf of their communities and constituencies, though sometimes individuals pay on their own. How much does it cost to subscribe to academic content? It can be extremely expensive. This chart shows uh, from 2019 some journal costs for scientific disciplines, and these are averages. So we see chemistry right at the top at almost $6,000 average price per title. And think there are gonna be many titles in many different disciplines, not just one. Um, so it can be extremely expensive to subscribe to these titles, these academic journals. And that prices out some readers and some libraries too. With open access scholarship, anyone can access the content as long as they have access to an internet connection. So the primary difference between open access scholarship and traditional or closed access scholarship, it's that in OA publishing, the bills are not being paid by the readers, so they don't function as access barriers. Open access removes these paywalls that can stand between readers and content. And here's an example of a paywall that I ran into. So here I was trying to access an article in a journal that we don't subscribe to. And I got the option to pay for that single article for $51 or buy that issue for almost $200. And these costs can really add up. And sometimes it's really difficult, if not impossible, to tell if the article that you're interested in is really an article that you need. So if you've just got access to the title and abstract, and then you pay 50 or $200 to get access and you find out that it's not what you need, that can be really frustrating and a great deal of lost money if you're trying to access multiple articles. So open access scholarship is free for readers to access, but just like closed access scholarship, it is not free to produce or publish. How is it funded? We're going to come back to this in a minute. Quickly, I wanted to share a few examples of how to recognize open access scholarship. Here is an article in the journal PLOS One, and near the upper left, we see the words open access next to a little unlock symbol. Here it's presented in an orange box that I put around it. So often you'll see the language open access, or you'll see that little unlock symbol, which generally is taken to mean that this is open content. 
Sometimes whole journals are open access. Here in this one, BMC Sports Science, Medicine and Rehabilitation, the aims and scope tell us that it is an open access peer reviewed journal. So this should be available to all readers and all of the content in it should be uh, open to all. Here I'm looking at a list of journals from the publisher Cambridge. And on the right, we see information with some of that says either contains open access with that little unlock symbol or just open access. The ones that say just open access, those the whole journal and all of its content should be available to all. The ones that say contains open access, some of the content will be open, but not all of it. And here I'm doing a search in the online platform for the publisher Taylor and Francis, and I'm limiting my search to only show open access content with that uh, little checkbox on the lower left that says only show open access. Here I'm looking at a table of contents from the Journal of Library Administration. And on the right, in the uh, lower right, we see that little unlock symbol in orange. And that means that this particular article viewed as equals is available via open access. There are also systems like the directory of open access journals that can help you find whole open access journals or just articles that are open. Many different types of content can be shared through open access. Most commonly, we're thinking about journals and articles when we're talking about OA, but you can also share data sets, books, pretty much any type of research output. What can you do with open access materials? You can read them, learn from them, share them, and cite them, all at no cost. But you can't generally edit or otherwise change them or reuse that content in your own work without explicit permission. If you're looking for open materials that have uh, more open licensing that might allow you to edit and reuse the content, then you might be thinking about open educational resources, which are generally licensed uh, with more permissive licenses that allow people to change, edit, and reuse that content. But you want to make sure that you are clear on what the author is allowing or licensing you to do. So now let's talk about open access benefits and myths. Why is open access important? It helps accelerate the discovery of your scholarship because it's available to all. It enriches the public and it improves education. Again, because these, are, these materials are available to everyone. And here's a little infographic that provides a few more benefits of open access, from exposure to allowing practitioners to be able to actually apply findings quickly, citation rates, infl influencing policy, complying with grant rules, and on and on. There are lots of ways that open access can benefit many people. There are also some misconceptions about open access. One is that it is pay to play, meaning if you pay, you can get anything published without necessarily being peer reviewed or having any kind of quality control. Uh, that authors don't retain copyright, that publications aren't peer reviewed, that publications aren't indexed in scholarly databases. We'll talk about each of these. So publishing in some open journals does involve what are called article processing charges or APCs. But in reputable journals, this doesn't mean that anyone can pay to get just anything published. We'll talk a little bit more about APCs and how all of this works in just a minute. With copyright, many open access journals allow authors to retain copyright, but you wanna make sure to look for the journal's copyright policy so that you're clear on what they're allowing. With peer review, legitimate scholarly open access journals maintain peer review standards that are generally comparable to non-open journals. Look for the journal's peer review policy so that you understand what they, uh, how they proceed in that area. And indexing is important. Uh, Google, Google Scholar is an example of an index and things like ProQuest 
and Scopus and many others that are out there being indexed means that your content is being included in these systems where people are searching and finding that content. So this really helps your work be found and read and potentially cited. Many open journals are indexed. That journal should be transparent on its website about where and what indexes its content is included in. What else can open access do for us? There's a growing body of literature shows that, that shows that articles made available through open access tend to have higher citation counts than those published through toll access. And this is known as the open access citation advantage. How much of an advantage? Well, there's a pretty wide variance. This slide shows a few, uh, the percentages calculated by a few recent studies from 8% to 19% to 40%, these are pretty different. So there's not consensus about the exact percentage that you can expect in terms of higher citations. There could be a lot of factors at work, including disciplinary things. But studies are continuing to show that there is an advantage in terms of the number of citations that you can expect being higher when you publish openly versus through closed or toll access. But this decision is part of academic freedom. You get to decide what the best way to publish and share your work is. So you get to decide as that author or with your co-authors if you want to share your work through open or closed access. Now let's talk about how open access publishing is funded. We've mentioned APCs or article processing charges. These are author side payments of a processing fee to the publisher. And this is very common in hybrid and fully open access journals. And I'll explain those terms in just a moment. Sometimes these APCs might be paid by the author's funding agency or employer, but definitely not always. These APCs are how some OA scholarship is uh, funded. This covers publishing costs that in closed access scholarship might be funded through subscription. Sometimes these APCs can be funded through financial awards or credits. The libraries can help you in this area. I've got some links here and I'm gonna talk more about this in just a moment. In rare situations, you may be able to get your APC waived in cases of hardship or geographic location. It is sometimes worth reaching out to the publisher to ask if you're in a situation where this would benefit you. APCs can really vary across publishers. They may be as little as a couple hundred dollars. Unfortunately, this is uncommon. Uh, they can be really expensive, as much as five or $6,000, even in a few rare cases up to around $12,000, which is kind of bonkers. Luckily, this is also uncommon. The average reflected in the literature and in what I've seen is around maybe $2,500 to $3,000. Unfortunately, prices seem to be rising faster than inflation. So publishers and journals should be transparent about APCs. You wanna look for that APC info on journal and publisher websites before you submit your manuscript. So you're clear on what the expectation is. And if the journal's website is not clear with you about that pricing information, definitely reach out to them. If they won't share APC if information with you before you submit your work, uh, that's a major red flag. So I wanna talk a little bit more about red flags and that you wanna watch out for what we call predatory or deceptive publishers. These are journals and publishers that operate under deceptive business practices. And they charge these APCs or publication fees to authors, but they aren't providing the value that you would expect through a legitimate journal, such as peer review to vet that research and other services like copy editing, layout, proofreading, et cetera. Uh, so we don't wanna be published by these journals because then our scholarship can be called into question if it hasn't actually been through peer review. Uh, and I'll provide some resources on identifying and avoiding predatory journals in just a moment. Now I wanna talk about open access publishing models. Here are the ones we're gonna talk about today, gold, diamond or platinum, green and hybrid. Gold open access is what we call traditional or journal-based open access. It means the whole journal, all of its content is available openly. And the journal is the one that's making that decision or the publisher that this is gonna be an open journal. 
Anyone on the internet can access the content, and generally this is funded through APCs, though there may be exceptions. With Diamond or Platinum Open Access, this is similar to Gold. It's a fully open journal. All content is available openly, and the journal or publisher is making that decision to be an open access publication, but there are not APCs in this situation. So these are great journals to publish in if you can uh, find a journal operating under this model in terms of uh, funding. So typically, instead of being funded through APCs, these journals are being subsidized through institutions or organizations that are shouldering those costs of paying the journals um, paying to make sure that there are people who can work for the journal and get that, uh, make that, those publishing activities happen. Um, green open access is also called self-archiving. And this is when you publish in a closed journal and then you as the author are posting copies of your work in an open access repository. This might be an institutional repository like NC Docs here at UNCG, or it might be subject or disciplinary, discipline specific. And generally you would only proceed with this if journal or publisher policies allow self-archiving. If you're allowed, then you as the author can determine if you want to pursue self-archiving. If you share through green open access, then anyone on the internet would be able to access that content in the open repository, not through the publisher site. And there are not APCs with this model. Hybrid open access is a closed journal that offers authors an APC option for publishing their work openly. So here, the journal or publisher decides that they're gonna have that hybrid model. And then the author, after they're accepted, can decide if they just want to not pay and have their work published uh, through closed access, or if they want to pay that APC and publish it openly. The journal content is closed by default, only limited OA content would, would be available to all readers. And this model has some downsides. So while authors have to pay to make those APCs to make the content openly open, uh, libraries are still paying to subscribe to journals, those journals as a whole. So in some cases, the library or the institution may be paying twice, both to subscribe to that journal and then potentially paying that APC for the author to make that one article open. So this model has some downsides, but it is a model that's out there. So I wanted to share it here. How do you choose how to publish or share your work if you want to share openly? There are a lot of factors that might influence your decision about where or how to publish. If you're targeting a specific journal or if you're open to considering different publish publication venues, if you're committed to publishing open access or if you're willing to consider self-archiving, if you have funding for APCs, all of these things might influence your decision in regards to open access publishing or sharing. There are many other factors that can go into influencing your decision about where to publish, but we'll save that for another time. If you really wanna publish in a specific journal, then you really are at the mercy of that journal's policies when it comes to open access, sharing, APCs, and other policies. If they have a hybrid OA model, then you will have the option to pursue OA upon publication by paying that APC. If the journal is closed, then you can consult their policies or, and you may be able to archive their, your work in NC Docs. And we can also help with consulting those publisher policies and determining if the work can be added to NC Docs. If you want your work to be open in some manner, but you're willing to consider both open upon publication or self-archiving, then you can probably consider almost any journal. If the journal is closed, you'll wanna check their self-archiving policies or ask uh, the NC Docs team to look at that after your work is published. If you're pursuing self-archiving, then make sure to submit your work to NC Docs after it's published. And I've got our email address here. If you really want your work to be open upon publication, not just through green open access, then you'll want to look at the journal policies first, then decide where to submit your work. There may be institutional funding for APCs that's available to you or potentially your co-authors at other institutions may be worth checking with them. 
If you don't have APC funding, then your options may be pretty limited. You may be looking for those diamond or platinum open journals. Now let's quickly talk about some support that can help in these areas. The libraries can help with evaluating OA publication venues, finding funding to support APCs, and with sharing open access scholarship. With evaluating, there are a lot of resources out there that can help you evaluate journal quality and avoid predatory journals. The first link here is to a site called Think, Check, Submit that offers a checklist to help you walk through evaluating a journal and deciding whether or not you think that their policies and their practices uh, are predatory or not. There's also a journal evaluation tool, which offers a really detailed rubric, and that can be consulted as you make decisions about uh, evaluating journal quality. And we have some recent presentation slides and recordings for some presentations on this topic. Is this a quality journal to publish in? How can you tell? Recognizing and avoiding predatory journals choosing the right journal and getting published, and help, predatory journal, what do I do? All of these are archived and the presentation slides and recordings are available and linked here. If you need help evaluating a journal, a publisher, or a conference, please ask. I'm available to assist with this. You can also contact your liaison librarian if you'd like to start there. If you're not sure who your liaison librarian is, I've included a link to consult on this slide. With funding, the libraries are glad to offer the Open Access Publishing Fund, which now offers awards of up to $1,500 to offset the cost of publishing in open access journals. And as a full-time faculty member, a full-time EHRA employee, or an enrolled graduate student, you are eligible to apply for and receive up to one of these awards in an academic year. Um, and I've got information here with links to the application form and our guide where you can go for more information. There are also other OA funding options where we're working directly with certain publishers for funding discounts and credits. With Cambridge University Press, we have unlimited APC waivers. So this is a great opportunity for publishing with them at no cost. We have a 10% APC discount with Sage. We have APC waivers available with IGI Global, a 10% discount with MDPI, and that's on both uh, article processing charges and book processing charges if you're publishing an open access book. And brand new this year, we have APC waivers available with the publisher Wiley. If you'd like to learn more about any of these deals, go to go.uncg.edu slash OA. And if you've got questions about any of these uh, OA public publication funding options, please get in touch. I'd be glad to help. Now with sharing. If you want to share your scholarship openly, but you can't afford APCs, then consider sharing through green open access in NC Docs. Here's an example of an NC Docs profile for one of our faculty members with a little bit of information about her and then links to her OA publications, which are loaded in NC Docs. And if we scrolled down, we'd see a long list of 97 publications. And all of these are available to readers at any location with an internet uh, connection. What can NC Docs do for you? It provides a stable long-term platform and profile for sharing your scholarship. It also shows usage, download counts of your work, and it can fulfill public access requirements from some granting and funding agencies that require public access to pub publicly funded research. How do you get or update a profile? Just contact us. You can send a copy of your article, presentation slides, or other scholarship, or just send us a copy of your CV or a list of publications that you'd like to consider adding. We take care of the rest, including checking those publisher copyright and sharing permissions. So we try to make things very easy. We're not always able to add everything because we do have to abide by, the, by those publisher policies, uh, but we will do our best in those areas. So we're wrapping up now. If you need a reminder on any of these topics, or if you want a session for one of your departments or courses, please ask. 
And if you've got questions in the future, please reach out. And again, here's a link to those slides. And a link round up here at the end with links to some of the services and supports that we talked about today. So I wanna thank you all for listening and watching. And if you've got questions, please reach out to me. Oh, and also a few uh, acronyms from today's presentation, if you'd like a refresher on any of those. All right, thanks very much.